Welcome to Pushback. I'm Aaron Maté. Joining me is Andrei Telechenko. He is a former Ukrainian diplomat who is sanctioned by the U.S. Treasury Department for alleged election interference related to his efforts to detail the record of the Bidens in Ukraine, which we are going to get to. Andre, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me on, Aaron. I want to credit Garland Nixon for this interview. Uh, he has a channel on YouTube, and he recently interviewed you. And you said a lot of really extraordinary things that I think people should hear. And for people who are not familiar with your record, with your background, just talk to us a bit about uh, your work in, in Ukraine as a government official. Yeah, right after the Maidan, the coup, I became, I was appointed as a senior policy advisor to the first deputy prime minister of Ukraine on security issues, intelligence issues, military issues. And then I was also appointed afterwards as a advisor and head of protocol to the prosecutor general of Ukraine, overseeing uh, all the international connections within the prosecutor general's office and his personal political uh, issues. And uh, was involved working with U.S. Embassy, Canadian Embassy, all the G7 embassies on working with the Ukrainian government. Afterwards, became a diplomat at the Ukrainian embassy and uh, worked very closely with the uh, White House and on the U.S. elections, which when I saw the corruption involved in the interference of Ukraine involved in this, I resigned from the embassy and left after six months of working there and became a political consultant Got involved working with Blue Star Strategies, a lobby firm from Washington. Uh, worked there for a year, the lobby firm which lobbied Burisma. And uh, that's how I saw everything from the inside. And uh, when I understood what the shocking results that was happening for my country, for Ukraine, not only for Ukraine, for the corruption was happening in there, I came out with the truth on the Ukrainian interference in the elections, the Hunter Biden story, Burisma, Blue Star. And that's so when I got involved with Rudy Giuliani. And afterwards, I got sanctioned when I testified and gave my evidence to the U.S. Senate, Senator Johnson, Senator Grassley's committee in 2020, in which out of the 87 pages of the committee report, uh, 27 pages are on my evidence and my email communications with the White House, with Blue Star, and what I went through at that time and what I could provide openly to the Senate at that time. Because they tried to subpoena me so I could provide more evidence, which were under contract, but Senator Romney blocked the subpoena in, in the Senate committee and did not, they didn't get any, enough votes to subpoena me and to bring me in officially. We're going so to get to that. That's where I am today. And I'm, I'm yeah. sanctioned. Yeah. So, so we're going to get to that. So it's really interesting. So Senator Romney, a Republican, blocked the efforts of other Republicans just to get you to come testify. So Romney, for some reason, really did not want to hear what you had to say. But before we get into that, so there's a lot there. Uh, you you say, first of all, you resigned over Ukrainian election interference in the U.S. You're referring to the, the period of 2016? Yes, that's correct. That's the p period of 2016 elections, presidential elections in the U.S. And so you're working then in the Ukrainian embassy uh, around the time of the 2016 election in Washington. Yeah. And what did you work I was, I was a third secretary at the embassy after being in my my positions in the government, I went to work at the embassy, got invited to work there, and I was overseeing the elections, as every embassy does. And uh, I witnessed, basically, I was, they tried to get me involved because I was part of the deep state at that time. They thought I was part of the deep state. And they tried to get me involved into helping them get dirt on presidential candidate Donald Trump, Paul Manafort, Carter Page, George Papadopoulos, General Flynn. And I was, uh, I didn't want to get involved in that. I, uh, they introduced me to this woman called Chalupa, uh, Alexandra Chalupa, which I talked about in the political article in 2017, which Ken Vogel wrote. And, and basically she wanted dirt. I said, so, no. And, uh, two months later, I resigned from the embassy and came back to Kiev. And that's how, uh, the, the process worked. I was, the, that was part of witnessing stuff within the White House, the meetings with the prosecutor general of Ukraine, uh, head of Nabu, where they were talking about people like Paul Manafort with the uh, Eric Shermanella and the national security team of Jim, uh, Joe Biden, the vice president at that time, and Chalupa meeting in Washington, getting uh, reports on George Papadopoulos and Carter Page weeks before the official investigation into them happened. So that's the witnessing I was part of 
unfortunately, and I came up with the truth on that. That's when I started to get smeared by the liberal media and by the uh, deep state officials, neocons. So let me just explain this for people who aren't familiar with this, that there are documented allegations of Ukrainians interfering in the 2016 election to defeat Trump. And this was actually admitted out in the open. There's an article in the Financial Times from a few years ago, and it's titled Ukraine's Leaders Campaign Against Pro-Putin Trump. And in this article, you had a number of Ukrainian officials admitting that they were trying to stop Trump from becoming president because they felt as if he would uh, not have their back in what was then this, you know, simmering proxy war in the Don, which is contained to the Donbass and Ukraine that began after the 2014 Maidan coup. So they were openly trying to prevent Trump from winning. And they worked with a woman who you mentioned, uh, Chalupa, who was a Ukrainian American. And this has already come out before that this was this effort to basically uh, interfere in the election. And as a part of this, there was the leaking of a black ledger, a so-called black ledger, alleging these secret payments to Paul Manafort. And that led to Manafort's resignation. Uh, but there's been questions about whether that ledger or not was even authentic or, or whether it was part of a smear effort against the Trump campaign. Do, uh, do you have any inside knowledge of that? I think this letter, ledger was just made up because uh, it was a part, nobody saw and nobody got the official documents themselves. There was only shown copies. The official documents allegedly went to the FBI, which uh, they were also not shown everything which were given to the FBI at that time by the so-called uh, pro-liberal uh, general Sleshenko from Ukraine. So uh, from my information, from my understanding, it was all a toss-up, a made-up story, just because they could not find any dirt on the Trump campaign. And they, from the witnessing of the White House meeting, in, which happened in January 2016, which was also mentioned by, by Laura Ingram a couple of years ago, uh, what happened during that meeting. The U.S. officials were asking for the Ukrainian officials to get any information, financial information, about Americans working for the former government of Ukraine, the Yanukovych government. They did not mention the concrete name, but it was the result was the Paul Manafort story and the Black Ledger book being made up and thrown into the public. Paul Manafort mentions this in his book and mentions me during the, me attending that meeting also, which came out this year. So this all story started to bundle up end of 2015, beginning of 2016, and started to progress within the 2016 elections, right around springtime, during the visit of Poroshenko to Washington, where he met Hillary Clinton, and he met every other candidate except presidential candidate Donald Trump. You could and see- Poroshenko, the, Poroshenko is then, at the time, he's the president of- The Europe. president, yeah. So basically, he meets everybody except, uh, he meets, talks with Casey, she talks with, uh, Hillary Clinton, who talks to other people, but he doesn't meet with presidential candidate Donald Trump, who has the most possibility to win the elections. And the, he is the representative of the other side, the Republican side, who has the majority of winning the elections. So you can see the bias process in going this. And while that is happening, the official meetings, the backstory is happening with people like me, the U.S. government and people from the Dem Democratic National Committee are approaching and asking for dirt on a presidential candidate. And the, the, what Chalupa said, she said, I want dirt. I just want to get Trump off the elections. We're going to have Marcy Kaptur get a committee together, and we're going to take him off a, a month before the elections. Kaptur Kaptur's done a yeah, member of Congress. Kaptur. Yeah. yeah, from Ohio. Yeah. yeah. And I testified everything of this to the Federal Election Commission. I got subpoenaed by the Federal Election Commission in 2019. There was a full-scale investigation. I testified under oath in Washington, D.C., and... After I got sanctioned, even though I got sanctioned for Hunter Biden, not the election interference uh, story, they still closed the investigation. They said because, oh, because Soshenko is a so-called sanctioned person, a Russian spy, alleged Russian spy, without any proof or evidence, they just named me that. We're going to close the investigation into the DNC story. And that's, that's how they had a case of Blue Star Strategies, DNC story closed by just sanctioning one person. And that's part of a well-established playbook that anyone can see now with their eyes open that anytime there are corruption allegations against a, you know, preferred uh, politician, especially from the Democratic Party, whether it's Hillary Clinton or Joe Biden, uh, Hillary Clinton's emails in 2016 or Hunter Biden's laptop in 2020, everything is just dismissed as a Russian plot. And that allows it to go away. That's the 
established playbook. And you've been cut up with that because you were sanctioned by the Treasury Department for spreading, quote, uh, fraudulent and, unsub and unsubstantiated allegations involving a U.S. political candidate. And that candidate refers to Joe Biden. Um, but before we get to that, because I want to go through your story here. You were also a government official in Ukraine around the time of the Maidan coup in 2014, which is pivotal to understanding this current moment that we're in, this current war we're in. So talk to us about, you know, about that coup, um, the forces behind it, and, you know, what you see, if any, as the U.S. role. I was, unfortunately, I was a big part of it uh, because uh, I was young. I was, I was, I just came back from the United States. Uh, I, I wanted Ukraine to be democratic. I took on the hook of uh, this whole full-scale democracy that the U.S. is bringing to the world. And uh, I was part of the Ukrainian opposition to Yanukovych at the time. And uh, they offered me to be a coordinator of the international relations on Maidan, on the unofficial part, where I worked closely with the U.S. Embassy, with the U.S. Ambassador Payet. I worked closely with uh, U.S. government officials. Like, uh, the invitation of Senator John McCain and his security was on my watch, and I coordinated that process. The unfortunate not new and cookies uh, was my idea in December 2013 when she was in Kiev. She wanted to give up bread. I we I recommended her that we should divert from that process. You're not Jesus. You sh you should come out to the people with more something more to the ground. And that's how the cookies process came out. So I was part of it. I was involved in that. And the U.S. government was in full scale involved in that. Not only the U.S. government, the G7 ambassadors, which are controlled by the U.S., but I was there. When the U.S. ambassador Pied would come to Maidan, I would have to be there to, to get him through the, through the crowd, to get him to the building where we sat and made our decisions, show him where the money was, show him where the right sector was, where they were preparing the cocktail molotovs and the explosives. I was witnessing all that process, and that's why they offered me a job right after the Maidan coup to be part of the Ukrainian government. And I was, and that's how I continued my work with the deep state people. And that's how I saw I was for them. I was a good guy at that time because I was part of their team. They had no problems with me being uh, a Ukrainian or, or speaking out because I was not speaking about them. I was part of the coup, and I got my security process that if something happens to me during the coup, I'll be, uh, the U.S. Embassy would help me to evacuate me if needed. That's like, if not a U.S. citizen, they, they just offered to do that because we had those kind of relationships. If I needed Pi to meet with somebody from the Ukrainian side, I will just give him a call on a cell phone or to him or to his assistant, and that meeting would happen within a couple of hours or vice versa, or he needed to, to meet with somebody from the Ukrainian side and that would happen. And that continued after the Maidan. But I can tell you, Maidan was fully coordinated and controlled by the U.S. government and the U.S. embassy in Kiev on the ground. They had the official side with the pro Soros people who did the PR, but the, all of those things in the behind closed doors were happening with the involvement of the U.S. embassy officials, who then became U.S. government officials at the White House, like Liz Zentos, who I was continuing to, to do my work while I was at the embassy of Ukraine in Washington, and she was part of the national security team of Joe Biden. So that's this process is interconnected very deeply, and this continues till today. The war started, unfortunately, for Ukraine, which at that time I did not understand. I understood it only a couple of years later when I came out with the truth in 2016, 17, and started to fight the deep state uh, not to control my country. But this start this process started in 2014 when the war in Ukraine and the interference from the outside led to people dying on Maidan, led to people dying in Donbas and let Ukraine be thrown under the bus and used as a rag for the cr corrupt uh, scandals and corrupt schemes for Joe Biden, the deep state, Clintons, Soros, and, and all, you can name them. They're all, they were all involved in Ukraine and had their money uh, just went through Ukraine, like Franklin Tem Templeton situation where the money laundering of $7 billion went through a US company from, from, by, of Ukrainian loans. So this is, this process is all interconnected what we see today, unfortunately. And, and when you refer there to George Soros, he is a you know a well known oligarch who has funded um, Western backed efforts in Ukraine uh, to support you know a, a political movements that the U.S. wants to basically install. Uh, that is um, that is also on record. So 
Okay, but going, but uh, keeping with this period of 2013, early 2014, the Maidan coup, uh, is it your belief, I just want to be clear here, that the U.S. was actively involved uh, in plotting a coup, or was it more they were just behind the scenes sort of um, encouraging events that could lead to that without being, you know, fully involved operationally in the, were, in the plan? They were fully involved financially and operationally. When the U.S. ambassador would come to Maidan headquarters, the yeah. one where the, the leaders of the opposition sat, he would make up decisions and basically he would officially give, not give orders, but he would recommend things. But everybody knew if he recommended things, this is how you have to have, this is how you have to do it. Uh, and coordination work on pushing and on the Ukrainian government, the Yanukovych government. I witnessed that this conversation when Newland came to Kiev and it was the first, uh, the first storming of Maidan at that time when the police tried to storm, uh, when the people already gathered on Maidan. And this was mid December, December 11th, I think. And I, I called the master pie. I said, you have to stop this call the, the president of Ukraine. So there won't be bloodshed. And in the meeting in the morning where we went to Newland and Pai, she said, I called Yanukovych and ordered him to stop it. He did not pick the phone for three hours, but then when he picked up the phone, I told him, stop the process or we will destroy you politically, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, they were there. They were controlling this process behind the closed doors. Yeah, it was all done in the hands of, by the hands of Ukrainians, but it was all pre-prepared by the U.S. embassy, the U.S. government and U.S political advisors on the ground in Ukraine who worked there for years, for 20 years before preparing this whole process and with Soros-led groups who influenced the PR, who were taught how to influence the PR and how to make this process likable for the public. So it was all interconnected, done with the Ukrainian hands, as it is right now. Ukrainians are fighting and splitting their blood and the Americans are fully behind it, helping Ukrainians with financially and with the uh, with the weapons, which are not leading to anything, but just people getting killed uh, instead of making peace, the same thing happened then. It was behind the closed doors where they were leading the Ukrainians to overthrow the government and to then have a new government which would be favorable in Washington. And uh, it's my understanding that you know, right before Yanukovych was overthrown in February 2014, there was a compromise reached. It was brokered by. Uh, European states that would leave Yanukovych in power, but with you know, limited authority and with earlier elections. But there was a split inside the Maidan leadership. Some Maidan leaders accepted this deal. Some didn't. Um, did you witness this? And, and uh, because right after this split happened, uh, Yanukovych was basically forced to flee in a, you know, in a flurry of violence. It was a promise to Yanukovych to step back and let the democracy prevail, as you can say, let the Maidan uh, politicians uh, lead their people so everybody would save their face, because at that time, the popularity of the leaders of Maidan was very low, and you needed something to boom this whole process. And they agreed on making these, as you said, elections uh, and making a new change of government peacefully. But because of the popularity of the Maidan leaders, like at Sinu, Klitschko was very low, people did not trust them. At the time, it was a whole situation where you have all these leaders from the, within the people who came up on the stage and became more powerful than the political leader themselves. So they need some, some big explosive, political explosive to happen. That's what happened. We had the bloodshed in February 2013, when in February 18th, and then on February 20th, where we had the shootings on Maidan. And that's what led, yeah, that's what led uh, to this whole political boom, a smokescreen to protect the political leaders of Maidan and to show that somebody, not them are bad, but Yanukovych is bad. And the deal with him was off the table. So they were just basically threw him under the bus with this deal, as they did with the deal in Istanbul and Russia, they made Russians to back off from Kiev, and then they continued the war. So it's the same thing uh, they did just last year. So you can see how it is being done, that you cannot trust the words of political leaders of the West, because they will throw you under the bus one day. Um, and so the Maidan massacre is a key event. That's February 20th, 2014. And that's where you have 
many people gunned down in Maidan Square. Uh, the, Ukraine, the U.S. government and the Maidan leaders immediately blame Yanukovych. And as a result of all the events that ensue, Yanukovych then flees. And when the coup is justified, that Maidan massacre is invoked to say, well, Yanukovych's forces gunned down these protesters on Maidan. But there's a professor at the University of Ottawa named Ivan Kachanovsky who has written a study about this. And he says, without a doubt, that the people behind the Maidan massacre were, in fact, people on in the pro-Maidan coup side. Uh, and he bases this on witness testimony, on video evidence, on forensic testimony. He even um, cites an interview from some members of the Maidan who say that they were told by some Western officials that uh, they would need a higher death count in Maidan to, ba to basically justify increased support for a change of government, if I remember that correctly. So that's according to, to, to his um, investigation. Do you think there was a Western role in the Maidan coup, in the Maidan massacre? What I can tell you is I, when I went to work in the prosecutor's office afterwards, I saw the Maidan case uh, was in documents, uh, the first case, because they, they changed them a couple of times. And from the original case, which I saw, Yanukovych involvement in this was barely none. That's what I can tell you. He was not in his, even in his office or in his house. He was outside of Kiev driving in three Ladas to, to a secure location with his bodyguards. And this is a testimony by his bodyguards who are government, working for the Ukraine government as the security service of Ukraine. And they testified that they witnessed him not understanding this whole situation at all. I don't want to put in to protect anybody here, but this is what I read in the official documents by the prosecutor's office of Ukraine. And what the, I, I saw what the, the professor from Ottawa University, uh, University of Ottawa published, and I agree with him. There are possibilities and there are connections with the West in this process. I personally did not witness them on my own. I can only tell you what I witnessed from the documents, but I agree that there's the connection to this massacre was from the inside of Maidan and from the people who organized this Maidan and the coup, not from the people in the Ukraine government, because this was the last thing they needed to happen in Ukraine. So after the coup, what did you witness about the role of the U.S. in in its influence over the Ukrainian, uh, the new Ukrainian government that came to power? Oh, full control. The Ukrainian government became, within the nine years of after the coup of 2014, fully controlled by the U.S. government and by the G7 ambassadors. We had when we came to work in the in the cabinet of ministers in Ukraine, and my first government position as an advisor to the first deputy prime minister we had meetings with the CIA director brennan for example and i was told who we we're going to meet but my boss did not know who could meet the u.s embassy told me not to inform him inform the first deputy prime minister who he's going to meet because he's not trustworthy he can leak this information so things some from small things like that telling us what to do to big things like telling us who to fire who to hire what what department to cut what to, department to uh, to inform what department to bring more money in these things would be set in motion and it, if it not the middle process would not listen to those issues they would go to the president directly or to the prime minister and then he would give an order directly to people to hire to fire to send more money and uh, basically they would control everything they would start the destruction of the, the Ukrainian bureaucracy and the administrative machine, that's which which I started to witness and I went against uh, in 2017 when this process led to changes where we had we saw the unprofessionalism of the Ukrainian police, unprofessionalism of the Ukrainian prosecutor's office, when we had foreigners walking around the government buildings and were placed in positions where they were not supposed to be placed with clear and full security clearance in the Ukrainian government, foreigners without even a Ukrainian passport were put in place and giving orders to not knowing the Ukrainian law, not knowing the Ukrainian language, they would just be there and giving orders and getting doing what they would have to do because the Ukrainians would stop listening to the US embassy officials. 
we would have, I would have times where the U.S. ambassador would call me and say, I need to meet with the prosecutor general's office, the prosecutor general himself in 30 minutes. And I said, this is impossible. He has a schedule. He is leaving for other meetings. No, I have to meet him now. This is an order. And, I, and if we told him no, he would call the president and the president would tell us to be the U.S. ambassador right away. So this is how it worked. The U.S. ambassador would control the president of Ukraine. And, and, and the president have, at the time is, is poor. poor shit. Shit. Yeah. And if you have people like Joe Biden and from the outside, Newland, call and from the State Department, you're, it's a, you're God. You're like, you can control everything. If you have connection to those people and they can call the president and tell them what to do, then you're in full control of the country. This is what led to people like Zochevsky putting in people like Hunter Biden and to have the connection to the big guy, the vice president of the United States, who oversaw Ukraine at that time in the White House. So this process led not only to the, uh, the corrupt corruption of, of Ukraine in my country, it led to the corrupt, uh, to destruction of Ukraine. Because you would have people, the old school government officials, thrown out of Ukraine government offices, who knew what they were doing? Yeah, they, maybe they were corrupt, they were Soviet, they were old school, but you, that's how the system works. The United, you go to U.S., you go to Washington, you see all these old guys there because they, they know what they're doing, for example. M most of them are with, with the clear, with, with clear conscience or, but in Ukraine, you have all these people being thrown out, have no jobs, they started working for the other side, and you have the young guys who have no experience, they were no experience even in business coming in to rule the country. And that's, they were do, doing that just because they can control these young guys. They can, they thought they could control me. When I came up and said, no, I don't want my country to fail as a state, I was told by the US government officials, by two embassy officials, Ken Toko, who's a political officer and somebody else from his team, that if I continue the stances of going against the US government and criticizing the, the so-called reforms in Ukraine because they're national security interests of the United States, I'll be politically destroyed by the U.S. government. This was told to me in 2016. I still continued, and they did try to destroy me, as we see, but I'm still continuing the fight. And this is process is still continuing in Ukraine. We can still save Ukraine. We can still save the United States politics if we at least start getting the truth out and start investigating these things properly. Um. Before we get to Biden specifically and the role of uh, uh, his role in, in Ukraine and the corruption allegations against his son Hunter, you know, being appointed to the to Burisma, why do you think the U.S. was so invested in Ukraine at this time? The way you describe it, the U.S. is you know, heavily involved not just in the Maidan coup, but in the period afterwards and telling people who to hire, who to hire, not, who not to hire. What what was the U.S. agenda for Ukraine? Do you think at this time? That's. I think it was not on the official agenda. It was made as an official agenda, but it was an official agenda for the people within the deep state and the Democratic Party. There was the possibility to make money in Ukraine with all these NGOs controlled by Soros, all this money process from the USAID funds and the National Endowment for Democracy and you name it. All those money, millions, hundreds of millions of dollars flowing into Ukraine, and they were all laundered because nothing was done. Yeah, you saw these little round tables going back and forth talking about democracy with pamphlets for a couple of hundred bucks spread out to the people. But that's not a hundred million, that's not two hundred million, that's nothing. Like this the money was given out for to, to teach Ukrainians democracy. They didn't need to teach Ukraine democracy anymore. They just wanted to put in their propaganda, make money on this, and just use Ukraine as a puppet. And because in Ukraine it would be popular for anybody who was pro-Western, who was, had connections to America. And you just come in and say, oh, this guy lived in America, this guy has some connections to you, somebody see this guy has some connections to somebody in, in Washington. You can get a government position, you can get something done with, without even paying money for, for this process because they would believe, Ukrainians would believe, oh, this is somebody powerful or this is somebody who has powerful connections. This was made to believe this process. Ukrainians made themselves uh, we are to blame Ukrainians who went for this and bought this little uh, process and we were the ones who were responsible for this because if we would stop and say no to to this control of our country, it, this Ukraine would still be there. We would not have war. We would have officials who would come up and say we can still negotiate peace. But no, it led to people to put people in place, weaken the government, make money from Ukraine, use Ukraine as a rag corrupt rag and 
do their dirty work. Ukraine was their dirty work country, which they used to make uh, dirty decisions, to make money, to put people in place, and to use it to fight against Russia. Because we know Brzezinski said uh, in his writings that if you have two Slavic countries fight and split, uh, spill blood, blood we ha you're going to have the destruction of Russia. This is what they needed. They needed a country like Ukraine. And Brzezinski you have Belarus. And, and the Brzezinski, just to explain to people, he is a former national security advisor under Jimmy Carter, very influential in U.S. foreign policy. Yeah, and he also, and this is taught in, U, in the U.S. and in the universities. When, when, I did, when I went to university, it was still taught. I don't know what happened to me now, but this is how they wanted the system to work. They needed a country, a puppet country, to use to destroy Russia. They, they had already destroyed the Soviet Union. The next uh, result was to destroy and dismantle Russia as a huge country, making it into smaller pieces. They tried to use Belarus. It didn't happen for them. Belarus still stands strong. It's still an independent country, and it still is there. But Ukraine fell under the influence of a foreign government, like the United States, and now is being used. So this is that's what they needed. And while using it for their national security interests, they used, as I said, they used it for their small, corrupt, or big corrupt cases to make money on the side of Ukrainian politicians who were giving over money to Americans. If you're an American lobbyist, you'd come to Ukraine or a government official, you'd get paid a lot just for coming to Ukraine. They'd pay you. Or just to meet with, uh, I was a political consultant myself. I knew how the government officials and all the guards said, we would pay money to go to America or to meet with senators, to meet with government officials, congressmen, and they would pay hundreds of thousands of dollars just for leads. Some paid millions. And this is how this whole process worked. So everybody was happy. Why would you need to change that? Everybody's making money. And this is what, as I said, is leading and it's led to this bloodshed today. Have you ever met Zelensky? And, and what do you make of of his transformation, because he was elected on a mandate of peace. He was going to end the war in the Donbass that began after the 2014 uh, Maidan coup. Uh, but ultimately, by the end of uh, you know the period leading up to Russia's invasion, he was refusing to speak even with the leaders of the Donbass rebellion and talking about taking back Crimea. And you know, I've long argued that he was basically intimidated by Ukraine's far right, who undermined his his peace mandate, uh, and they were aided and sabotaged in Zelensky's mandate by by their allies in Washington. Uh, what do you make of of Zelensky and how you know he was transformed from a you know a pro peace candidate to basically a pro war president? Yeah, I met him right after third day after he became president of Ukraine, and. Uh... I had lunch with him. I, I worked in a t for a person at that time. I consulted a businessman who actually financed Zelensky's campaign. I did not want to believe that our president could be a former actor. But as I said, there were, but I was told that he would come in. He's not a professional, but he would bring in 70, 80% of professionals from different sides of the table, right, left, center, old school, sort of times anything and just start building the country together because that's what the platform is. The people who supported him and financed him, that's what the agreement on for that. And uh, at that time, it, and I can say it was not Kolomoisky who I worked for, it was another person. Because and, Kolomoisky right is an, and Kolomoisky is a Ukrainian oligarch who was said to have financed Zelensky's candidacy. Yeah, it was other people also who financed this campaign, not only Kolomoisky, but there were other businessmen and oligarchs involved. Because everybody wanted peace. Everybody wanted the, the after the reign of Poroshenko's regime and the full control of the West to, that to end so we could live peacefully with Europe, with Belarus, with Hungary, with Russia, get back our territories like Donbass peacefully as even as an autonomy, just basically support the Minsk agreements and work with them and get our country back together and stop this whole process of bloodshed in Ukraine because Ukraine was always was always a peaceful country. But Zelensky coming to power, he changed dramatically within the first two months. Hmm. And he changed not because it was all not a, it was also pushed by the radicals and nationals within Ukraine, but because Kolomoisky had problems, business problems and uh, political problems. He was under investigation by the FBI. And even though he co he collaborated cooperated with the FBI very closely for some numerous uh, years, 
And uh, he also, I met with Komoski and he told me that person. And I, and he also had a, a lot of problems, business problems in Ukraine. So Pinchu basically helped him move those problems away and took over uh, control of Zelensky for some time. So they traded him in. And uh, that's how Zelensky became and was arranged a meeting in, in London with the intelligence community. And that's how Yermak became basically the president of Ukraine, where Zelensky Yermak traded off Ukraine's independence and sovereignty and livelihood to the West. They became full control by the Western governments in 2018, around June, July. That's when it all happened. Let's explain some of these names. So Yermak, who you mentioned, that's a reference to Andrei Yermak. He's basically Zelensky's chief of staff, plays a very big role in Zelensky's administration. So you're saying he plays an even more prominent role than than is publicly known. Yeah, he is basically the, the president of Ukraine who decides what to do. He just, he's the one who talks with the U.S. officials, like Salman, who are behind the back doors, yeah. making all the decisions in, in the White House. These people are controlling Ukraine. These people are the ones who are responsible for what's happening here. And they all knew that this war is going to happen two years before the war started. And, and if you properly yeah. investigate that, you can find proof. And and you also mentioned another name. So Kolomoisky is the oligarch publicly associated with Zelensky. You're alleging there's somebody else as well? I didn't catch his name. There were numerous. I didn't mention his name. This person oh, who I worked okay. for. There, there are numerous people who helped finance the campaign of such person, uh, uh, Zelensky. And um, they were behind back doors hoping for peace hoping for this thing to to end in Ukraine. But the, afterwards, they, they all got sanctioned by the Zelensky regime, being Ukrainians who got sanctioned by their own government. Even I got sanctioned by Zelensky in Ukraine illegally, and I'm suing him on the Supreme Court of Ukraine today. On what grounds? So, grounds because I got US sanctioned by the U.S. government. Okay, so you were and, sanctioned by the U.S. government for alleged election interference, and then the Zelensky government sanctioned you as well? Yeah, just because two days before going to Washington, he wanted to play play nice with the White House and the, he sanctioned people like me. So a couple of days before going to Washington, just because to play nice with, with the White House because they they knew they didn't like people like me. So that's what they did it. And to show that they're loyal to them, they sanctioned Ukrainian citizens, even though it's against the law and it's against the Constitution. I'm right now suing the Lansky Supreme Court of Ukraine. If they fail to process my case and even close the case on any grounds, I'm, I'm going to go to the European Court of Human Rights, which 99.9% .9 I'm going to win uh, against Zelensky. And they'll have to, they'll be able, they're going to pay me money because they, they sanction me illegally in Ukraine. So this, this is how bad Zelensky is. He, he went against the people who helped him. He helped, he went against the people who wanted peace. And he, just because he traded off the sovereignty and independence of Ukraine, to foreign intelligence and foreign governments, he did. He started to go in against people like me, who wanted who wanted to fight against what he was trying to bring war to Ukraine. Because we supported him, even though I did not believe that a, uh, an actor, a comedian, can be a good president, I support that he could be, have a strong team with him and to bring peace to Ukraine. He promised that. That's why people voted for him. Seventy-three percent of Ukrainians voted for him because. Most of them wanted peace. They did not want war. They wanted peace. And they wanted uh, Minsk agreements, which Ukraine signed by Poroshenko, by even supported by Zelensky, to be submitted, voted in parliament, agreed on, and having back our territories like Donbass as an autonomy and live a peaceful life afterward. That's what we, we wanted. Unfortunately, everybody were played, the Ukrainian public, the Ukrainian people were played by uh, Zelensky by his team and by the deep state and they just turned this whole process around and, and were leading Ukraine to war. They knew they're going to have war. They knew they will they will have this process. They thought they could maybe sell off to the Russians. I think they were making deals with the Russians, but they were not offered so much money by the Russians. So, uh, even uh, And they were just continuing to do their role as war mongers and continue to bring Ukraine to war. They were making money on building roads. They knew that this, they're going to be a total destruction in Ukraine. They knew that this process was going to go, but they were building roads. They were showing their good government, getting Ukraine back together. But they started to continue to press on democracy, 
throw people in prison, going against opposition leaders, closing down political TV channels, were working with the opposition, talking about peace, not war. And this process started, and, and the West just closed their eyes on this. They just they didn't, or they, they didn't cheered, or they stuff. cheered, or or they cheered. Like in early two thousand twenty-one, after Biden takes office, Zelensky, you know, shut down some opposition television networks, and the the State Department cheered that. Um, yeah, and later I, on, I was talking- Time Magazine, Time Magazine reported, based on conversations with Zelensky aides, that that shutting down those TV networks was a welcome gift to Joe Biden. Yeah. Yeah, I was part of those. I was going to those TV channels. They were inviting me constantly talking to talk about you know, what's happening in Ukraine. And then just one day they just closed out. They were, we were afraid to go there, even though we went, because we thought every time we go there, there would be provocations outside the TV stations by the Nazis, by the uh, radicals. And they were throwing bricks, uh, eggs, and people who just went and talked on TV. Talking about peace in Ukraine, bringing Ukraine back together. This is how the process in Ukraine was. This was, was the process which was supported by the West, financed by the West throughout these last years and nine years especially. And uh, they were just closing their eyes on this. There's no democracy in Ukraine. As soon as I got sanctioned, I called up a friend who was a deputy minister of foreign affairs in one of the European countries. I don't want to name his name, but I called him up and said, look, if I want to get a political asylum in your country right now, if I want to flee Ukraine, will I be able to do that? He said, I'll get back to him in a couple of days. He called me back and said, unfortunately, no, Ukraine, is, in our standards, is a democratic country. There are no problems in the, for, with democracy in Ukraine. And if you're a Russian or Belarusian, yes. If you're Ukraine, you cannot get a political asylum in Europe. That's what, well, that was the answer by one of the deputy ministers, foreign ministers of a European country. So this how they see Ukraine. They just close their eyes on everything. Today, the process in Ukraine was happening. People are getting killed talking about peace. People are getting thrown to prison and being beaten for talking about peace. I had three friends shot by the security service of Ukraine. One was kidnapped and one uh, was beaten for a week. And then they just threw him out because he agreed to say whatever they told him to say uh, under a gunpoint on their TV channel. And that's how the process works. He had to flee Ukraine and had to basically go through a rehabilitation. And he told me about it. He got beaten for a week by two guys with a high caliber bullet with red, red in his kidneys. And he's 65 years old. He's, he's not an oligarch. He's not a businessman. He's not a politician. He's just a political expert, former military who retired in the 90s and talking about how to make peace in Ukraine. And the three other friends who, who got shot, one of them has a child. Who, who's on a wheelchair, he, the, the security service of Ukraine just came to him in his, in his front door and just shot him right in front of his family. Nobody talks about this in, 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 in the West. This is all being covered up, and this things are happening. There's thousands of cases like this in Ukraine. People are getting kidnapped, people are getting destroyed, people are getting tortured, and this is the democracy which is being financed by Washington and the European governments today, and this has to stop. Nobody's talking about peace. Nobody's talking about peace outside of Ukraine, only some groups of Ukraine. That's why people in Ukraine are quiet. People would want to come out and talk, but they, they know they're going to get shot, killed, beaten if something happens or something happens to their family because if they talk about stopping this war. So that's why people are quiet in, in Ukraine. But Ukrainians want peace. A lot of people do want peace. There's 30, 40 percent maybe of radicals, but the majority wants this to end, this nightmare to end because they have to survive. Are you familiar with uh, a Zelensky uh, friend and former aide named Sergei Savoko? Have you heard of him? No, unfortunately not. Okay. Uh, Savoko, who, who, who was he? Just a- he, was, he was a former comedy partner of Zelensky's. And a- after Zelensky was elected, he was appointed to a, a commission to basically bring dialogue with the Donbass to promote peace. Oh, but yes, shortly, yes, yes. But Savoko, shortly after, Savoko. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I mispronounced it. Um, short, and shortly after he unveiled this new sort of dialogue commission, some members of Azov basically attacked him at his opening speech, yeah. and and then Zelensky fired him shortly after that. Basically, which is sort of it's a it's one encapsulation of how Zelensky ultimately took the side of the people who wanted to sabotage his own peace agenda. Yeah, yeah, I, I know who you're talking about. I, I know him. I met him a couple of times. We're not friends. I don't talk to him, but I met him years before. And I know what you're talking about. When he came out with uh, Sivoha, he came out with uh, this negotiation 
the process of even a peace, small peace plan on how to start talking with the Donbass uh, uh, and Lugansk uh, republics and how to bring them back and talk to them with the Ukraine government. He could basically got sabotaged by Zelensky. Right in front of, it happened all in front of Zelensky's eyes because it all happened in the headquarters of the party of the servant of the people where he was doing this, right by the front doors where you have total security by the government. And they let him to basically, they threw him under the bus, showed him that Zelensky's not going to continue this whole negotiation process with Eastern Ukraine and basically just changed directions. He changed directions, I said, in June. Uh, July 2018, when he, after meetings with British intel community, and he basically got guarantees well, that well, he's going to get protected. It couldn't be 2018 because he was elected in 2019. So, sorry, 2019. I apologize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Which June, still, June, July 2019. Yeah, right. And, and he takes office, I believe, in April or May 2019. So that would have been right after. Yeah, that. in May, in May he becomes the president officially because yeah. the first round it ends in April, second round is in May, and then in yeah. June, July, that's when Pinchuk and Kolmoisky make a deal that Pinchuk is going to save Kolmoisky from his business dealings with the West and have the U.S. back off. I said Kolmoisky is under sanctions with the U.S., but he's yeah. under only visa sanctions. He's not under financial sanctions. He can, he's able to use all his bank guarantees. So that's the deal. He's able to use all his money, but he cannot travel to the U.S. and go outside of Ukraine. And from on, my, on the other hand, I am under full sanctions, financial visa, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, these people made a deal to throw Ukraine under the bus just to save their own lives and financial dealings. And this is where we are today. So let's get to why you're under U.S. sanctions. But before we do, I just want to explain for people who have been following this conversation but are hearing a lot of these names and these incidents for the first time because so much – of the you know of the details of the facts of the Ukraine crisis are kept from NATO audiences. So just just to explain one thing, the Minsk Accords, which we've now referenced many times, that's a deal reached in 2015 in between the Ukrainian government and the rebels in the Donbas, who are backed by Russia, uh, to end the war that began in 2014, the year uh, prior, after the U.S. backed Maidan coup, and that war began because basically the new coup government backed by the U.S. Uh, tried to um, crack down on ethnic Russian culture inside of Ukraine. And Minsk essentially called for granting ethnic Russians inside the Donbass some limited autonomy uh, in exchange for uh, their region being demilitarized and, and the war coming to an end. But Ukraine's borders would have remained intact, just giving these uh, Russian-aligned people of eastern Ukraine some limited autonomy. But the Ukrainian government, under pressure from the far right, refused to implement it uh, under Poroshenko, who signed it, and then under Zelensky, which brings us to the present moment today. So let's talk about Joe Biden. Um, what did you witness when it comes to uh, th this whole controversy, which still remains unresolved? And anytime someone tries to discuss it in the U.S., they're just accused of spreading Russian disinformation. But but what can you tell us about Joe Biden's role in firing this prosecutor, uh, Shokin, Victor Shokin, who was investigating Burisma? which is the energy company that gave a very lucrative board seat to Joe Biden's son, Hunter, right after the U.S.-backed 2014 Maidan coup. Basically, uh, what, what the backstory is with Burisma, the company itself was form, formed in a corrupt way. Like a lot of things in Eastern Europe, as you may say, but no, this company was formed in a very specific way. The owner, Zolchevsky, was the minister of ecology. And he himself, gave out his own company certificates for gas development. And that's how the company became a monopoly basically in the gas market in Ukraine because they got most of the certificates because the owner was <laughs> the head of the company. And the, Biden joined already a corrupt company which is under investigation by the Prosecutor General's office. There were four criminal cases opened in 2014 against Burisma and two more Additionally, opened by Shokin when he became the prosecutor general. So whenever everybody, anybody says there were no criminal cases, nobody was investigating Burisma, this was all a lie, Shokin was fired because he was a bad prosecutor, he didn't do his work. No, he did his work, but he did the work, he went out against the wrong people, as you can say, because they went against him. Of course, these people aren't going to be happy that they're going to go against him. They're going to fire him or they're going to they're gonna tell lies. But he did his job. He opened two more case, criminal cases on Burisma, which were later closed after Shokin got fired, after a new prosecutor, Lutsenko, a politically appointed prosecutor, attorney general in the U.S. terms, became 
uh, attorney general without, without even a law degree. This guy doesn't know law at all. They had to change the Ukrainian law for him to become the prosecutor general. That's how bad the situation was. And this Lutsenko guy was very close aid to Poroshenko, basically his relative in one way or another because uh, God saw, he, like, he, he was the, the godfather to one of his children. And and just explain, he, sorry, Lutsenko is an anti-corruption bureau guy? No, he was a politician close okay, to Poroshenko okay. who became prosecutor general and attorney general in U.S. terms of Ukraine without a law degree. They changed the law for him to become prosecutor general specifically after Shokin got fired. And he closed the cases. The Burisma just paid two hundred thousand dollars of uh, fees for some tax evasion, etc. That's it. But Shokin did his job. Shokin got because he was looking not only into Burisma and Zolchevsky, he was looking into Hunter Biden directly. There were red flags of the financial transactions of uh, the payments to Hunter Biden to Cyprus from Latvian financial intelligence that the money itself were corrupt. The money itself were coming from not uh, legit. Uh, sources. That's and he, Hunter Biden knew that this money was corrupt because the people who were currently up for him, Blue, Blue Star Strategies, that's the company which I was advising for after I worked with Washington. They were the ones who were basically covering up everything for Hunter Biden between Joe Biden and Burisma. And Amos Holstein was the person. They, Blue Star Strategies was working closely uh, to get information to Joe Biden directly because they cannot go and see Joe Biden directly. So they had a person, the intermediary, Amos Holstein, who was a gas expert, to basically deliver all the official information to Joe Biden himself on Hunter Biden and Burisma and what has to be done and how to save that company from being prosecuted, from being closed down or uh, being shaken up. So this is why Hunter Biden was hired to this firm. To get and being, being Hostein, paid. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt, but Amish Hostein now works for Joe Biden as a yeah. senior official. Yeah, at that time when they when Hunter Biden signed the agreement with Blue Star uh, with uh, Burisma and Blue Star Strategies came on board, Amos Hostein was a State Department energy guy yeah. overseeing energy in the, from the State Department. So he had clearance to go to the White House directly. And I was told this directly by Sally Painter and Karen Tramontana, who are the owners and CEOs of Blue Star Strategies. And they're not only a, a lobby firm, they're former advisors and chief of staff to the President Bill Clinton in the 90s. So these people are connected directly to the deep state and Hillary Clinton and the Clintons and Biden and Obama. And this process was, was being done in a way that uh, when Shokin opened up two more cases, and that's when the things got uh, basically started hitting the fan. That's when Joe Biden got involved and they, they fired Shokin right away after basically less than almost a bit more than a year he was working on this position. And he's an old school prosecutor. He's a prosecutor from the Soviet times. He was very famous for closing down big cases in Ukraine in the 90s and the beginning of 2000s. And he's not somebody that like, he's not somebody from the outside. He's the guy from the inside system of the prosecutor's office. And he knows what he's doing. And that's why he was doing his job perfectly fine. But on the other hand, we see uh, Joe Biden coming in, Poroshenko playing a game that he's not involved in this. He let Chokin also be thrown under the bus. And he changed to a person, even a much more closer person like Lutsenko, uh, to be heading the prosecutor's office, which then was very loyal to the U.S. Embassy in Kiev, even though Lutsenko went against them working with Rudy Giuliani, but he was very loyal while he was working at the prosecutor's office to the U.S. Embassy and to the U.S. government. And Joe Biden later brags when he's speaking, I believe, at the Council on Foreign Relations that he leveraged U.S. loans, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in loans to get Shokin fired. I said, I'm telling you, you're not getting a billion dollars. I said, you're not getting the billion. I'm going to be leaving here. And I think it was, what, six hours. I looked, I said, I'm leaving in six hours. If the prosecutor's not fired, you're not getting the money. Oh, son of a bitch, <laughs> got fired. And they put in place someone who was solid. Yeah, that was the deal. And I, I can tell you that it was, itself, it was the system of how they were working on uh, with the prosecutor on the prosecutor's office. After I left in a while, I was still working with the embassy. And after I left the embassy, I helped Blue Star arrange meetings within the prosecutor's office with uh, the, the uh, acting prosecutor, Savuk, after Shokin. He was there for a couple of weeks. And they came to Blue Star Strategies, Karen uh, uh, Tramontano and Salah Pinter came to see 
this acting prosecutor and then they came to see him with Lutsenko. Also, they were there talking and trying to close the case and uh, negotiating with Lutsenko on how to close the case for their client, uh, Zlochevsky. That's how the system worked. They, they were working interconnection with the White House and getting this thing done. And Blue Star, while they're so important, it's not just to say a lobby firm, these people were working as intermediaries between Joe Biden and Boris and Hunter Biden. They, as soon as Hunter Biden was offered a job, they made a report for, uh, for Joe Biden, three reports, two legit to show to the public, and one basically a black report behind the doors, uh, one which showed what really Boris was, what were the problems, how, to, how Joe Biden family can make money on this, and by covering up their problems and what can be done if can the U.S. help cover their problems uh, for, for Burisma. And they showed this process to Amos Holstein, to Joe Biden directly, and he knew what his son was getting into because this was told to me also by Sally Painter. She told me this directly in 2019, February 2019, in Mexico. I can testify on this, all of this. But uh, no, they, they, they blocked me from testifying because they, they're afraid that I can t I'm going to tell the truth and this is going to come out officially and going to be officially investigated. They lied to Star to Congress. They lied to Senate when they were, you know, they, when Johnson and Grassley uh, asked them questions and their committee asked them questions, they lied about everything and they got off the hook. They, they did not register even in FARA to work with <laughs> Joe Biden. That's how bad it is. And well, from small things to big things, they were involved in this in a very corrupt way and covering everything up for themselves and making money on this. And money was made not only on Hunter Biden's salary and on the board of directors, there were being equipment sold to Burisma from Texas, United States, and with involvement of Joe Biden after meetings in Mexico with uh, Burisma officials and big drill equipment, one of the, one of the big, large drill equipment in Europe was sent to Burisma from Texas, United States even though the, the company was under full investigation in Ukraine and everybody knew about that. Okay, I, I want to try to catch people up on this part of the interview because there's a lot of names here and I think for some it might be hard to follow. So and correct me if I've gotten anything wrong or I'm missing anything. After you leave the Ukrainian government, you work for Blue Star, right? This Western yes. firm, right? After I leave the embassy, em embassy. After you leave the Ukrainian embassy in Washington, you work for Blue Star. And Blue Star is a Western firm that is working with Burisma, this energy company where Hunter Biden got his board seat. And you're saying that Blue Star officials, like the ones you've mentioned, told you that Joe Biden was was very was actively involved in their various uh, machinations inside of Ukraine. Yes, of course. They, they, he was he knew what was happening. He knew where his son was going. He knew where Hunter Biden would be serving as a board directors. And he knew how corrupt this company was from the beginning. Uh, and it had started, and that's how they knew how to make money on this because it was done in this unofficial report, which was given to Joe Biden, the vice president of the United States at that time. And that's how it all leads to where we are today. And it is true, it's just publicly known that no U.S. official had more influence inside of Ukraine after the 2014 Maidan coup than Joe Biden. Um, that's why on that recorded phone call between Victoria Nuland a senior U.S. official, and Jeffrey Piat, the then U.S. ambassador, right before the U.S. coup. Uh, and they're talking about who they want to install as the next Ukrainian leader. And they settle on Yatsenyuk, who went on to become uh, the head of Ukraine after the coup. Uh, they say that they need the attaboy from Joe Biden and his then top aide, Jake Sullivan. So it would be it would make sense that then Joe Biden goes on to play this you know very influential role uh, after the coup, which, you know, for which there's plenty of public evidence of. But what do you think Joe Biden's interest here is? Is he just trying to help out his son, Hunter? Do you think he's, is he personally profiting off of the, the you know, the uh, the windfall that Hunter Biden reached? Like, what what do you think is motivating Joe Biden here for playing such an active role inside of Ukraine and, 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 the, and all this stuff with Burisma? I cannot speak for Joe Biden what he thinks. I think nobody can at this moment. But uh, what... What he, from what I see, is first of all, yeah, he wants to help his son. That's the clear point. His son uh, just is a drug addict who has no job. He got he just got fired from the military after getting a job there. He, he gets a position in this big gas company after a coup in Ukraine. Yeah, this gas company is corrupt, but Ukraine is good, so we can cover up with a PR move. Why not? 
want to do this. Not only Hunter Biden was on the board of this guy company, he was also the former president of uh, Poland, Kwasniewski, and other officials, former uh, CIA, high, high ranking CIA officials, were on the board members of this company. So why not have his son make some money on the side? But knowing where his son is going, uh, that this company is corrupt and there's going to be problems, that's already raises questions for a politician uh, that he didn't know about this and that this is going to lead to problems in the future. Or you know that you can cover them up so you don't care about them. That's one thing. Second part, making all these big deals and getting Hunter Biden getting his father involved in making those big deals, as I said, example, of one of the, uh, the buying one of the biggest drills in Eastern Europe for drilling gas from Texas, United States, and involvement of Joe Biden after he got involved in this, that's raising the questions, did he profit of this? And I think he did. From my information, he did profit of this. He didn't make money on this. Not only because of the whistleblower that came out, there, there's more than what the five million that they're talking about. There's more involved in that. There was more getting paid to the Biden family directly than we, we know when we talk about today. And that's where his interests are. And being today the president of the United States and going to elections in 2020, when I came out with this in the Senate, if I was a politician and I, and I knew that they, there was nothing on me, I would say, yeah, sure, investigate me. That's what I'm telling today to the U.S. I'm ready to have to have my day in court investigating proper. Show them, tell me what I'm, what I'm, what you're accusing me for, and I know because I know that there's nothing to show or nothing to tell. But here, he, he tried to cover it up, he tried to cover it from the beginning, because he knew there's more involvement, not just his son getting paid dirty money, but there was more involvement of him getting paid dirty money in this process by dirty politicians from Ukraine to cover up dirty work that was done for a corrupt, one of the big corrupt companies, largest, biggest corrupt companies in Ukraine. So this whole process smells bad. And if you want to run for presidency, you have to talk about this because this is democracy. This is what we are taught about, right? To talk about, we have to know, the people have to know who they're going to vote for. But no, they covered it up. They closed uh, people like me down. They tried to destroy people like me. And they're now running the country and not only running America down to the ground, but they're running Ukraine, my country, down to the ground. If we had properly investigated this whole thing and found out that Biden was involved in this and was getting paid before 2020, he would not be president. There may be no war today. Maybe. I don't know. But probably yeah. there wouldn't be. There would be less chances. Get hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians would be saved uh, from our side and Russians would be saved. People have not much for blood. We would have peace in Donbass, but no, this whole corrupt scandal, Ukraine being used as a rag, we, we see today led to the bloodshed in Ukraine and the destruction of the United States democracy. Where the whole world is just laughing at after the 2020 elections because the U.S. showed what democracy it is. There's no democracy in the United States also. Yeah, I mean, whatever one's opinions on these allegations, and I... There, it's not something I've looked into, so I'm not endorsing any theory. But what is this is my point of view? Yeah, I, I got it. But what is what, what is known? What is uncontested fact is that before, right before the 2020 election, it started emerging that there were some material on Hunter Biden's laptop speaking to how he was trading on his family name for business opportunities, including in Ukraine. And rather than letting the public see the contents of that laptop and the reporting based on it and decide for themselves. It was censored on the fake grounds that it was Russian propaganda, which then raises the obvious question, what else is being denied from the public in the you know name of combating Russian disinformation, which itself is an act of disinformation, as is, un as is undoubtedly clear now from the Hunter Biden laptop. Um, when you, so when you tried to speak about this publicly, you worked with Rudy Giuliani, you know, a close aide, a close friend of Donald Trump's, a close ally of his. And also Senator Ron Johnson of Wisconsin. And both of them have been accused of spreading Russian disinformation and baseless conspiracy theories. When you read about this stuff in the media, it's just it's just all the time portrayed that way. Or it's referred to as unsubstantiated claims, which is interesting because um, that suggests that they might actually be true. Uh, but the, but we're not allowed to look into it because it's just dismissed as Russian propaganda. So but talk to us about you know your 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 collaboration with Giuliani and, and Johnson and, and what happened to you when you tried to you know go through them to speak to the American public yeah Johnson basically almost uh, they tried to lose the election 
in Wisconsin just for, for Senator Johnson because he collaborated and got information from a witness in the U.S. Senate like me. And they, that's, that's how bad they went. And they tried to destroy him in, in the last elections. And they also tried to destroy Rudy Giuliani for working with people like me. Basically, uh, I was already uh, working in Washington as a consultant. And I had a phone call from a friend that Rudy Giuliani wants to meet with me and in Kiev. But he didn't come to Kiev. I was in Washington a couple of weeks later, and he invited me to come and see him in New York. And that's how I met with Rudy Giuliani in uh, May of 2019. And I got invited to see him uh, in a New York office where we sat for a couple of hours. We talked about this. We talked about my testimony. And he asked me for it to help him on um, documents that he's going to get from Ukraine to basically help him look through those stuff throughout this whole process and if see there's something legit or not legit because he, I don't he, he saw that I was trustworthy at the time. So uh, that's how we start our started up our friendship where and our work together. I didn't get paid by him. I was just there on a friendly basis and fighting for the truth. And uh, basically a couple months later, I got invited by Senator Johnson. He uh, heard about my situation and he, his staff called me up while I was in Washington, D.C. and arranged a meeting for me in his uh, office in, in, in the Capitol Hill where I came to see him in July of 2019 and uh, talked about this, gave my uh, information and they said we will look into it, which they did and they gave me a call back in December 2019 and said we want to work with you as a witness and if you can give us more information. That's how I started working with Sarah Johnson and his committee. And uh, while working with Giuliani, there were a, lo a, a lot of political problems and pressures from the outside, of course. And one of them was the involvement of people like Derek Hatch, uh, when they came out into the picture one day and uh, through third parties like uh, Andrea Artemenko, who... And let's just explain who, who that is. So. Yeah, I don't want to get people, I don't want to get people involved, uh, too much in traction, but basically it was a chain of events why we led to how this... Uh, allegations of Russian disinformation got onto Rudy Giuliani and right. onto and because, Johnson, because so. Andre Andre Durkach, he is a Ukrainian politician, but he's been accused by the U.S. of being a Russian agent, right? Yeah, he officially admits that he worked for the FSB or went to the FSB Academy. Okay, he talks right. so about he acknowledges it publicly. It. Okay, got it. Okay. Yeah, and but he got he basically got involved with Rudy Giuliani by people like Andrei Temenko, who's also a public figure who's mentioned a lot. In the news reports, when well, Giuliani was in Kiev and in the news, and uh, he's a business partner with Derkach, and uh, he brought him around to the table to meet with Rudy Giuliani, and he, he thought they thought they're going to get information to Rudy that's going to be helpful for him. Maybe some of it was, but the bad part of it is, I think it was an inside operation by the FBI because Artemenko is an informant of the FBI, and I think it was an inside job uh, to get. To discriminate people like me, Giuliani, and other like Johnson, it's, uh, and put people like Derkach in the middle. Maybe they did bring some good information in, but the people himself with the, such background, when you have a Russia Gate process for years happening before, you don't have people like with the background like Derkach involved at all. Uh, you only have them involved if you want to destroy this whole investigation. I think that's what happened. Okay, when, as soon as Derkach was brought into the table by the third party, they got a person who worked and collaborated with the FBI very closely for numerous years, and that's publicly known. This person talks about it. This investigation got destroyed within the public really fast, and by the media, they just waited for something bad to happen. And this bad thing was their catch. As soon as he gets back into the table, I get mentioned as a Russian agent, Russian spy. Uh, Giuliani gets mentioned as a Russian agent, Russian spy, Hunter Biden laptop because it's connected to Giuliani has it. That's probably from Derkash, so it's Russian disinformation, Russian spy stuff. Senator Johnson, uh, because he works with me and because Derkash name mentions Johnson's name in one of his press conferences in Ukraine, he allegedly gets mentioned as a Russian agent, Russian spy. So this was a deliberate disinformation campaign to destroy people like Senator Johnson, Senator Grassley, Rudy Giuliani, and me and others, and labeled them as Russian agents. And that's what legitimized the, the deep state to them sanctioning falsely yeah. and illegally with connection to people like Derek Hatch with election interference. So this whole process would have been different if, if first of all, 
the politicians would be loyal and play their part, like Joe Biden would come up and say, please investigate me. Yes, I have nothing to hide and other stuff. The deep state and the media would not go with the orders from the top to destroy people that didn't just look and dig for anything they could find falsely, even falsely, to label us as Russian agents and Russian spies. So this whole process, that's how it's worked. We know how it works today because anybody who comes out of the truth is, is labeled as Russian spy. Soon it's going to be Beijing spy or Chinese spy because Russia is going to be no longer popular in the media or something else. They're going to be labeling people Chinese spies. So that's why that's how the how nonsense this whole process is. Right. Okay. So just to summarize, you know, this this tangent because uh, we've covered a lot in this interview. Uh, you bring information to Giuliani and to Ron Johnson. But because Giuliani, during the same period that he's trying to investigate the Bidens in Ukraine, he also meets with this guy, Andre, uh, Andre Durkach. Uh, Durkach, who you say actually is a Russian agent. Because Giuliani also meets with him, that gets used to discredit you. And when you're sanctioned, you're saying that you have nothing to do with this guy, Durkach. So the allegation that you, you're somehow tied to him, you're saying that that's false? The witness, there's witnesses like Chanel Rian from OAN News, who was the hosting those videos with Giuliani in Kiev, t- testified to Congress uh, just recently that she witnessed that I'm not connected to their catch or have any connection to their catch at it. all. Got it. Okay. So it's not even my word. There's already witnesses Got it. Uh, who were testified in all this process. And during this whole time, I worked closely with the FBI counterintelligence unit and giving them information on Blue Star strategies hmm. and on their work with Hunter Biden. And they never, nothing happened out of it. For more than from May of 2019 till November of 2019, I collaborated uh, on a friendly basis because they offered me to be actually, uh, to work with the FBI officially, not for the FBI, but with the FBI to work officially. And, but I denied and I worked on a friendly basis and gave information on Blue Star, which led to nothing, and nothing was investigated out, out of it at all. And as a, during this whole process also, I got subpoenaed and testified within the FEC on the Ukrainian election interference process, which under oath I did. And as if I lied, or if I ever was Russian agent, Russian spy within this whole process, I would be prosecuted and I would be sent to court, not just falsely sanctioned without any possibility to go in front of the jury or in front of anybody to prove my case wrong. So that's how they they just politically tried to destroy me by sanctioning a person like uh, like me. I'm not an oligarch. I'm not some politician who has money. I'm just a former political consultant. I cannot even open up a bank account anymore today anywhere in the world. I cannot even get a job anywhere. And so this is how this process works. They politically destroy you, get you uh, toxify so much that anywhere in the West, if you go, you're going to be done. Your story reminds me a lot of Konstantin Kalimniks, who is a uh, Ukrainian national, also a Russian national too. Uh, he has dual citizenship, but he worked closely with Paul Manafort. But because he became very convenient to the Russia Gate narrative, because they needed somebody from Russia to make Russia Gate look somewhat credible, so it. He be, he went from being a very trusted Western source who was meeting regularly with Western officials, translating their interviews, sending emails to them in close contact, meeting with them when he comes to the U.S. Because when he became convenient for the Russiagate narrative, all of a sudden he became uh, branded as a, a Russian spy by the Treasury Department, not by the FBI, because the FBI knows he's not a Russian spy, but and and then also sanctioned as well, um, and the, you know. Uh, He's been called all sorts of names by different, but like depending on which government agency it is, nobody can fig- can figure out one narrative for him because it's all basically being used to promote a narrative that could make Russia Gate look credible. And and you know your story as you tell it um, has a lot of uh, echoes of that. Uh, so going back to your efforts to speak out on this, you were subpoenaed by Ron Johnson to come testify, but Senator Romney blocked your testimony. Why? They blocked the subpoena. They tried to subpoena me because uh, to get more information on Blue Star, which was under the contract which I had with them. And I said, I'm, I gave everything to the Senate, which was before and after the contract. But what was happening during the contract with Blue Star Strategies, I said, look, it's a US firm. I don't want to get sued afterwards for a million dollars. Subpoena me and I'll provide everything for you. I'm ready to give it. I cannot give without a subpoena. 
And uh, they said, Senator Johnson talked about it for numerous times. There's clips of it on Fox News. They said, they, if they would just let me subpoena Telzhenko, there would be no problems. I would just come up and get, get documents from him and investigate him. That's basically a quote. And at that time, when they tried to subpoena me in March of 2020, Senator Johnson blocks my uh, subpoena. They come up with a story on CNN that I'm trying, I tried to bribe some U.S. senators years before during my consulting work and uh, with some third sort third party cnn writes this story with some third party from ukraine who says that he, i told him all that pro all that stuff and that's when senator johnson said i'm not going to subpoena and even though that story never led to anything there was no case filed it was total nonsense and just taken out of thin air this the, they basically blocked my subpoena and senator johnson says like, okay i'm just going to subpoena blue star strategies then they try to block the subpoena for Blue Star Strategies, but then because it's so obvious, they did let them subpoena Blue Star Strategies, but Blue Star, Karen Tarantino and Sally Painter lied in, in their testimony to the Senate. I know Karen Tarantino and Sally Painter directly because I worked directly for them on Ukraine. They were the ones that would report directly. I had you know, all the communications which I could provide to the Senate, I gave them, and that's in the Senate report between me and Sally Painter. And this firm, as I said, it's very, it's very tough a very professional firm in what they do. They don't only work with the deep state in the U.S. and Joe Biden, but they also were lobbyists for Prince Charles at, at one point in time. I don't know if they are still today for the king. They were helping him become the future king of England. So these guys are the deep state. They know what they're doing. They're, they're, they know how to cover up things around the world, not only in Ukraine or U.S. So... They did their work and they, nothing was done to them. They lied. They registered with FARA seven years later after they, they didn't register with FARA for working with uh, Burisma. And the case was closed for them because I got sanctioned, so there was no case. Nobody can go and testify against them. Um, Andre, because you're saying all the things you're saying, you're going to be accused of spreading uh, Russian disinformation, which is, uh, as people now know, it's a very... Uh, Test, tried and tested tactic for silencing people. But, but let me ask you, do you have any connections to Russia, to the Russian state? Have you ever worked for Russia? Do you have any business with the Russian state or with any, uh, you know, uh, Russian nationals? No. I, yeah, I know Russians. I think everybody in the world, some people do know Russians or other people from different countries. But the last time I was in Russia, I was representing Ukraine in 2008 when I was still in school. And that was a long time ago when I was a student from, from school working with UNESCO. That was the last time and only time I was in Russia. But uh, no Russia connection at all. That's the problem. And I said, I'm ready. Let the, let the Treasury Department publish what they have on me. And I'm ready to go against them and let them show the public what they have. They have nothing. Even what they have, it's, it's nothing that to sanction a person. So they're just lying about me because there is no Russia connection. And there's people who testified within the Senate, like George Kent. Everybody knows that name. That person was involved in the Russia Gate uh, Congress reports, and he was testifying in Congress. He was working for the State Department. He was a deputy head of the embassy in Ukraine. Now he's the ambassador of the U.S. to Estonia. He testified to Senator Johnson uh, on uh, I think 10 pages of his testimony on me that I have no Russia connections. And I think if Senator Johnson knew that I had any Russian connection, he would never take my testimony or any information from me, as he did he did not, he did not do from Durkach. So this whole process just thinks with uh, just was false testimony from this other side. I am ready to talk about the truth. They are not. I'm ready to be labeled as a Russian spy because I'm not a Russian spy. If I was a Russian spy. I would not. I would be probably sitting be quiet like Derkach. Nobody hears about Derkach. He's sitting quiet. He did his job and he's out there. I'm fighting for my life and fighting for the truth. I was put on a kill list. I was written about Central for Security Policy. I don't know if you know this organization. Wrote about me. Michael Waller wrote about me uh, about how I'm not a Russian spy. Larry Johnson wrote about how I'm not a Russian spy. He's a former CIA agent. Yeah. And they talked about how I was, I was put on a kill list because I told it came out with the truth. People were trying to kill me in Ukraine. I had to flee Ukraine, not because of the Russian uh, war in Ukraine, but because they are, my own government wanted to kill me because I was fighting for peace and fighting for the truth. This is how bad it is. 
and I'm ready to continue the fight, even though they, they can name me anything they want. So I want them to let them show proof. I'm ready to come up and to, uh, testify under oath. I gave whatever documents I had to give. I have more to provide, and I'm ready to provide those documents. But let them provide, let them show the documents what they have on me, and I'm ready to appeal them in any way. I'm not afraid because there's nothing. Is that kill list you mentioned? Is that by chance the Mirat Ver, the Mirat Verets list, or is that or is it something yeah, else? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we're, yeah. So we're on the same list. We share that distinction. Oh, of there, being you on the same list. there you go. You're also a Russian spy. There you go. <laughs> All right. Um, any words you want to leave us with, Andre? Uh, you know, as we're speaking, the U.S. has just announced it's going to send cluster munitions to Ukraine, uh, which is a which is a considerable. Uh, escalation when it comes to you know sending over weapons of, of death and it means that this war will go on there's as we're speaking there's very little prospects of diplomacy at least that we can see publicly um any words you want to leave us with as we wrap yeah this whole thing with the cluster bombs this whole thing with the war itself why is it not the, the u.s sending diplomats why isn't the u.s sending pick up the phone with biden talking to putin because they they want to con continue this war. This war, as we talked about this whole uh, this whole time, it was prearranged. They wanted Russia to show and invade into Ukraine and to have spilled the blood between Ukrainians. They were preparing Ukraine for this war for nine years because I lived in Ukraine. Ukrainians start to hate Russians every day more and more, even though we are the same blood, we are the same people. I'm, I said, I'm not a Russian spy, but I'm a Ukrainian who knew how this, how Ukraine was 30 years ago and what it became today. It's total, for me, it's a total fa failed state. It breaks my heart to see Ukraine like this. And I want Ukraine to thrive and, and to be at least saved from what can be saved today. That's why we need diplomacy. We could have saved it years before. We could have saved it last year. Nobody did anything. Today, U.S. sending more weapons, sending more money to fight. But why not they're praying for peace? And things like this, if we negotiate, if we investigate this corruption of Biden's and how Ukraine was used, it might lead to at least a small puzzle of closing this whole case and bringing peace to Ukraine. So people could see why it all happened. Because Ukraine was used, unfortunately, as a rag to make money for people like Biden and his family. And this whole thing just has to end. We need to make peace because it's going to lead to more bloodshed. Bloodshed of, first of all, Ukrainians which are dying for somebody's values or somebody's pocket to be filled with money. Zelensky, who's a billionaire, and Joe Biden, who's profiting from this, and generals and everybody else who are making money on this from outside Ukraine. And this has to end. I just want peace for my country. I want Ukraine to thrive and Ukraine to be independent and sovereign. Andre Telezhenko, former Ukrainian government official, thanks very much for joining me. Thank you.